So, uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome to the 11th uh, annual um, Joseph F. Mulligan Memorial Lecture. And for those of you who are new to this, this most of the new graduate students, and of course, they are our guests. This is uh, really a dedication to one of the founding members of the physics department and the founding dean of the graduate school at UMBC, Joe Mulligan, who at the end of his career was interested in the history of physics and physicists in general. And he wrote a book about Heinrich Hertz. And he's very interested in 19th century physicists. And so after he passed, his family uh, made a donation to the, to the department. And we thought, well, what a nice way to sort of remember him it would be to every year have someone give a talk that had something to do with the history of physics or a physicist or something like that. One year we had um, the 50th anniversary of the laser. So that was sort of history and there were people in that. But it's nice to be able to think about how science was created, right, by people because of the context in which they live. And that's part of what this is all about. And I want to point out that there's an open um, application process for this. If you're interested in doing this kind of a lecture, send me an application. It's, there's on the web, and there's been an email sent out. But there's a link on the web. It's just a short proposal of what you'd like to do and who you'd like to work with. And I think it's kind of fun. And there's a stipend that goes with it to cover some costs you might have to travel, to do some research. And I think that uh, everyone who's done it so far has been pretty happy with the result. I know that the department certainly has. So today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker today, but I'm going to introduce the mentor first, uh, Dr. Matt Pelton, and he's going to tell us all about the speaker today in LA Speakers. <laughs> I'm very happy to be able to introduce the family leaders here. Matt Madley is one of our star graduating seniors here in the physics department. He's also finishing a minor in astrophysics and psychology at the same time while doing research with Dr. Meyer and also working about 20 hours a week, I think, at NASA Goddard on developing detectors for X-ray detectors for space, uh, future space missions, which is going to continue very shortly afterwards when the University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, continued the, de the development of detectors for astrophysics. The, the satellites. Um, while doing all of that, she's managed to spend some time you know, learning about two physicists of the World War II era, a Japanese physicist and a Japanese American physicist. Which of course, is something that I know absolutely nothing about. So my role here has really just been to give some encouragement to Natalie and to watch her do this research and to learn something interesting myself. Because as, as Dr. Hayden said, um, you know, we teach physics as a body of knowledge, as you know, a series of facts, but it's also a practice, something that people do in historical context. And we do talk about that, but we tend to tell the same 10 or 12 stories over and over again. So Natalie will be talking about something that's a little bit outside of the conventional narrative that we present in uh, you know, the history of physics and the people that do physics. So I'm really glad I've had the opportunity to learn about two outstanding physicists from the World War II era, and also the fact that we did a little more about one of our extended physics students for embarrassing the world. Thank you, Dr. Felton. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for coming to this lecture today. Um, I feel this talk is well suited for the month of May because it coincides with two relevant events for my talk. So the month of May is also uh, Asian American and Pacific Her Island Her Heritage Month. And as my talk will focus on one of my relatives, a Japanese American physicist, I feel this talk well aligns with the intentions of the Heritage Month. Secondly, May 16th will be the 57th anniversary of the firing of the first laser, a project my relative worked on. With these two coincidences, I'm really excited to share my research with you. So to start out with, I would like to introduce the two physicists I'll be talking about today. During World War II, there were many Japanese physicists who contributed interesting research. However, I wanted to choose two that I felt were the most in interesting. Uh, Dr. Yoshio Nishina and Dr. Charles Asawa. Dr. Nishina was a key figure in Japan's history of physics and an established physicist during World War II. Starting from a simple farming background, he quickly proved himself to be an insightful experimentalist in the field of spectroscopy, a talented theorist in the field of quantum mechanics, and an intrepid spokesperson for Japan's physics research. 
Initially, I chose to examine Dr. Nishina's life because his involvement in Japan's nuclear weapons program served as an interesting counterpoint to Dr. Zasawa's experiences living in Rower War uh, Relocation Center before being drafted by the U.S. Army. However, as I began to explore his research, including the creation of the klein nishina formula, experimental confirmation of the meson's ex existence, and the construction of Japan's first cyclotrons, I found a much more interesting story of a man determined to place Japan at the forefront of cosmic ray and nuclear physics research. His tireless work ethic, even during the war and leading up to the last month prior to his death, was truly inspiring. Similarly, in Dr. Sawa, I found the story of another man with a strong set determination of his own, but with a more personal connection to my own life. My interest in Dr. Asawa was first sparked when I was a young child. I remember my grandmother, Kimiko, telling me stories of her cousin, Charlie, and his, how talented he was in mathematics. It may be a little too determined. <laughs> um, no one in my immediate family was a scientist, let alone a doctor, so hearing about how a relative of mine had become a physicist stuck without me throughout my youth. When I got to college, I decided to major in physics and see for myself what it was that drew Dr. Asawa to the field. It was only after my junior year that I could truly appreciate Dr. Asawa's research and realize that he had played a significant role in the development of the first laser. So with that, I would like to introduce you to their lives within the context of the war. Starting uh, here, I will use these three time periods to go through their research and their lives starting from before the war, during the war, and then after the war. So without further ado, let's start before World War II. So Dr. Yoshio Nishino was born in 1890. His parents were wealthy farmers and salt makers. Uh, however, during the Meiji era, uh, they lost their wealth uh, due to the collapse of the government and a new national currency being made. So their local currency lost all value. So he decided to become an engineer to recover his family's wealth. So he started his education as an electrical engineer uh, at Tokyo Imperial University, and he got both degrees in engineering. However, he decided to focus on physics uh, during his time there. This was in part due to Dr. Hantaro Nagoika. Uh, he was the physics chair for the newly established Institute of Physical and Chemical Research, also known as Riken. Uh, by the time that uh, Dr. Nishina had gotten to grad school, he started attending uh, lectures by Dr. Nagoika, who was already an established physicist known for his Saturnian model of the atom. So a little background on Riken. It was established in 1917 in Tokyo to compensate for the lack of um, medicine during World War I, uh, Germany had created a blockade and they were finding shortages throughout Japan. This was the first established um, lab where multiple scientists could get together to perform basic science research rather than applied research in agriculture and so forth. What was even more key about the development of Riken though was that it allowed scientists who were practicing theoretical work and uh, maybe loosely based experimental work that didn't pertain specifically to medicine or agriculture to travel abroad with funding from the government versus funding from their families. So this allowed Dr. Nishina to travel abroad for seven years, which was outstanding for a Japanese physicist at the time. Typically, it was limited to two years because that's what families could provide. Uh, during this time, he traveled from England to Germany, then Denmark, and all over. He ended up going to the United States for a short tour uh, across the entire country. And during this time, he created really close ties with scientists such as Rutherford while he worked in England, and Bohr in Denmark, and Pauli in Germany. And he had two major, uh, two major experiences while he was abroad, which was the um, study of X-ray spectroscopy, which helped him become a really well-known uh, experimentalist, and the development of the Klein-Nishina formula, which I'll go into shortly. So, when Dr. Nishina was abroad, um, he ran into difficulties uh, studying with Rutherford in, uh, in the England lab. He didn't speak English very well, and 
uh, his two years of research there led to nothing. So he reached out to Bohr uh, before deciding to give up in physics entirely, and uh, Bohr graciously accepted him, and he moved to Denmark in 1923 and began to perform X-ray spectroscopy experiments. Uh, in this time, his biggest contribution to the lab was the development of a new spectroscopy technique that would allow scientists to examine the ratios of uh, materials within a sample to a higher accuracy than before. And this uh, research was performed with Dr. Dirk Koster, who was also an established physicist by that time. So once Dr. Nishina established himself experimentally, he decided, you know, I'll try theory. <laughs> And so after five years of working in Dr. Bohr's lab, uh, he asked Dr. Bohr to send him to Germany for one last hurrah and uh, study quantum mechanics with Pauli. So while there, Dr. Nishina <coughs> attended multiple lectures and he was introduced to Dirac's electron theory, which was the introduction of relativistic quantum mechanics and the introduction of electron spin. So while there, um, Dr. Nishino's mind was absolutely sparked with the ideas of, okay, now how can I apply this to Compton's effect, which I will explain shortly. And so he returned to Copenhagen, where he was introduced by Bohr to Dr. Oscar Klein, a physicist who is well known for his uh, unification of electromagnetism and gravitation by the invention of a fifth dimension. He worked with Dr. Klein to create a, the klein nishina formula to describe Compton scattering um, relativistically. So a little background for those of you who might not be physicists in the audience. Uh, Compton scattering, very simply, is a photon enters into the system, sees a stationary electron, and is scattered off with a lower energy while the electron is allowed to start moving and has energy. So the most important thing here for Dr. Nishino's work was the angle of the scatter photon and its initial energy. So this is the Klein-Nishina formula. It may look a little intimidating, but all it's saying is that the intensity of the scattered photon is proportional to its initial intensity, and then it depends on its angle and its initial energy. So this result was first published in 1928. Uh, it gives the intensity of scattered light as a function of scattering angle and initial energy, and it utilized Dirac's understanding of the relativistic nature of the system. It was also later used to derive the uh, cross-section of the photon-electron interaction, which directly relates to the probability <coughs> of a photon scattering through a certain angle and really told them more about the uh, event that was occurring. So some images from their papers. This is from Dr. Nishina and Dr. Klein's first paper uh, where they published the intensity equation and it showed how the classical theory didn't fit Compton's uh, experimental data. However, uh, their, theater, their theory seemed to fit much better than Dirac or Compton's. And this was experimentally confirmed by Reed and Larson in 1933 where they uh, determine the scattering coefficient or the scattering um, cross-section for the Compton effect and they applied the Nishina curve versus the Dirac curve and it fit it much better. So by the time that uh, Dr. Nishina had returned to Japan, he was an established physicist um, but just slowly getting recognition in Japan. It was difficult for him to get a job while he, when he returned because he had been abroad for so long and all the professorships at Tokyo Imperial University were filled. He came from an engineering background, so he couldn't get a physics job. Um, Japan was very strict about this at the time. And so he continued to lecture uh, as a guest lecturer because he absolutely loved teaching people about quantum mechanics. Um, the new ideas of quantum mechanics hadn't reached Japan yet, and so he was one of the first people to invite lecturers from abroad and introduce the new generation to the field of quantum mechanics. Um, with this, he gained recognition from the upper management at Reichen, and this allowed him to get a job there and become a chief researcher, opening his own lab in 1931. In his lab, he focused on two primary things, uh, cosmic ray composition and intensity, and the development of Japan's first cyclotrons. 
So here's a picture of Dr. Nishina's uh, Cosmic Ray group. There's Dr. Nishina. And the group had a split where Dr. Nishina was mostly in charge of the experimental work while he had another student take care of the theoretical side. So a little background on cosmic rays. Uh, they were first discovered in 1901, but they were experimentally confirmed by Victor Hess in 1912. He flew up in a balloon and showed that the intensity of these strange um, particles were increasing as he went up. So very simply, cosmic rays are created by fast-moving uh, atomic nuclei, which are primarily hydrogen, so it's protons hitting our atmosphere and they can generate subatomic particles, and you may have heard of muons or pions. Uh, those are generated by cosmic rays striking our atmosphere. So Dr. Nishina took the first steps for Japan's cosmic ray research by developing his theoretical and experimental group. He published his experiments between the time of 1931 to 1935 in a paper um, called uh, On the Nature of Cosmic Ray Particles. And this was followed up by another paper um, describing more of what he did in the first paper called On the Mass of the Mesotron. And so this was, the first paper was a confirmation of a new particle, uh, the mesotron, also known as the meson now. In his paper, he published this image, which is a uh, cloud chamber. And this little trace here is the path of the meson entering into the system. Um, as it tracks through the system, it uh, disperses the uh, liquid in there and it, co it um, condenses and leaves behind this trail. And so by comparing this image to previous images, they could see it wasn't an electron, it wasn't a proton, it was something kind of in between. And this was the first experimental confirmation and it had been predicted by another Japanese scientist in 1934. Uh, in the 1937 paper, they had estimated the mass uh, quickly, but they didn't connect this to uh, Dr. Yukawa's paper uh, until 1939, waiting for confirmation from external sources in the Western world of physics. So following this work, Dr. Nishina wanted to translate from cosmic ray work into particle physics and nuclear physics. And so cosmic rays uh, for the study of nuclear physics was very limited because experiments couldn't be repeated perfectly <laughs> and the energies were a lot lower than um, they would be able to create in a lab. So cyclotrons were the next best thing. And so basically a cyclotron is a particle accelerator that spirals outward into a detector. And so they could create high energy beams that would spiral out. And these were the predecessors of current technology, such as the Large Hadron Collider and the Accelerator at Fermi. So Dr. Nishina built Japan's first cyclotron, and it happened to be the second cyclotron built in the world. Uh, the first one was built by Dr. Ernest Lawrence in uh, University of California, Berkeley. And he actually asked for a lot of help from Lawrence and sent researchers there to study with him, actually. And so the first cyclotron in Japan, and this is a image from his first paper on uh, building the cyclotron. It was, um, it started in 1936, and it only took one year for them to build because they had a lot of help from the American group at UC Berkeley, and also had a lot of help from the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Scientific Research. Uh, this was kind of the establishment of big physics in Japan. Uh, it was the first time that a lot of physicists had gone together with other researchers from around Japan to sit in one lab and work on one project together. And it received a lot of funding from external sources, which was a big deal at the time. And here is a clearer picture of the final product. Um, at this time, uh, in 1937, after the completion of the first cyclotron, uh, Japan started making movements to join World War II with their invasion of Manchuria in August. And around that time, Dr. Nishina's research slowed. And so his work from the beginning of the war ended here. 
And I will make a brief segue into Dr. Asawa's life prior to the beginning of World War II. So Dr. Charles Asawa, he was born in California. He was a Japanese American. His parents were immigrants for J from Japan. Um, following the um, end of immigration from Chinese, um, from China, the US blocked uh, immigration from China. So Japanese uh, immigrants took their place and they were able to own farmland in California. And so his family bought a farm. And Dr. Asawa showed a lot of interest in mathematics from an early age. I remember my grandma telling me how when uh, they were younger, she would constantly try to bother him to play with her, but he would be busy doing math. And she would often not understand why he was so focused. But uh, as we'll see later, there was a reason. Uh, Dr. Asawa's research and ability to do so was limited prior to the war because um, of two major events. His father passed away in 1930, and then his brother passed away in 1934, so he had to become the co-head of the farm with his mother. Later on, in his later teenage years and his early 20s, he was able to start taking night classes at a local community college, and he decided to major in math, but he also took physics classes at the same time. So that ends the before the World War uh, time. Something that occurred that prevented Dr. Osawa's ability to continue on with this degree was the beginning of World War II. And in the beginning of World War II for America, which was after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Japanese internment started to occur. And so at this time, um, Japanese uh, immigrants and Japanese American citizens were evacuated from uh, California, Oregon, and Washington to camps further from the coast. Uh, they were first sent to um, centers that uh, would then lead them to relocation centers. And this was first started by executive order by um, Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, that allowed the military to force people to leave their homes without any um, real reason, aside from the fact that they wanted to group Japanese, uh, people of Japanese origin away from what they considered a uh, method to contact Japan and give them American secrets. And so here's a map of the, so this red area is where Japanese citizens were not allowed unless they were in a camp. And the blue dots are camps, <coughs> and the uh, black squares are where they were sent before processing centers before being sent to the internment camps. So Dr. Asawa's family uh, stayed first in Santa Anita, and then they were moved to the Roar Re War Relocation Center. So uh, here's a map of the camp. And so Dr. Sawa and his family, including his cousin's family, my grandma's family, were sent to live in the rural relocation center. After being forced to live in the Santa Anita racetrack for four months, they had to live in a horse stall um, before being sent to live in barracks with uh, over 8,000 other Japanese, uh, Japanese American <coughs> citizens and Japanese American immigrants. Uh, I actually got to go visit the internment camp, and while I was there, I was able to find a picture of Dr. Asawa's cousin, uh, aside from my grandmother. Uh, and so here's Jane Asawa. So during the internment, they created high school so students could still attend school at the time. Um, and so some of them graduated high school from the war <laughs> relocation center. <coughs> And here's a picture from 1940. Uh, here are the barracks that they were living in. Um, multiple families had to crowd into one room, and then on top of that, multiple families, multiple families in one uh, stretch. And around uh, the entirety of the camp were guard towers, and so um, they were not allowed to leave. They were guarded 24-7. Today, if you go to the site, there's nothing. Uh, they destroyed all of the uh, evidence of it being there following the war, but a lot of it has been kept and preserved in museums. 
So during uh, internment, a year later, uh, Japanese Americans were allowed to leave the camp if they answered <laughs> these two questions with yes. So the first one, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty? So are you willing to be drafted into the army? <coughs> and then the next one was persuading all allegiance to the Japanese emperor, someone that Japanese Americans would have no concept or loyalty for. They had to forswear their allegiance and swear everything to the United States. Many families were split apart because of this, and if people answered no to both of these questions, they were sh uh, sent to California to be sent back to Japan, even if they weren't from Japan to begin with. For my family, uh, everyone answered yes to both these questions, so they stayed in America. Uh, Dr. Isawa was allowed to attend the University of Cincinnati uh, for his degree in mathematics. However, he was shortly after drafted into the army and was then sent to Japan as a translator um, during the U.S. occupation. So, Dr. Asawa's experiences during the war conclude here, but Dr. Nishino was facing other challenges. So here is Dr. Nishina and his lab working on the second cyclotron. Uh, this would be a 60 inch compared to the previous one, which was a 26 inch cyclotron. Dr. Nishina's research continued, albeit at a slower pace. Um, following the beginning of Japan's entrance into World War II in 1937, communication between Japan and Western uh, countries <coughs> was kind of put to a halt. Um, but Dr. Nishina still made every effort to continue his research. He sent uh, some people in his lab back to uh, Dr. Lawrence's lab at Berkeley. However, they were turned away at the door because the president of the college did not believe that Japanese citizens should have access to nuclear materials, despite uh, wanting to do so for purely scientific reasons. However, um, they received blueprints for the 60 inch cyclotron, which Dr. Lawrence's lab had already built, and they were also allowed to leave with a newly purchased pump, which they were desperately in need of. Uh, the construction of the cyclotron continued from this time into 1943. It took five years for them to build this cyclotron because of the issues with uh, lack of resources and um, lack of information from the outside. Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor ended all communication with uh, Western countries. Uh, science kind of was brought to a halt <laughs> because they couldn't get uh, papers in to keep doing research and there was no way to manufacture the tools they needed. So it ended up slowing Dr. Nishina's lab in very significant ways, but they continued and they ultimately finished building the cyclotron in December 1943, and they started operating it in 1944. A lot of papers from this time, from 1944 to 1945, were lost because Japan's government would not release uh, the information since the papers focused on the um, develop the enrichment of uranium for Japan's nuclear program. And here's another picture of Dr. Nishino's lab uh, with the cyclotron. Uh, just again, reiterating that this was big science for them. Even during the war, they kept working at it. So um, Dr. Nishino became the head of the nuclear project called NIGO. And it started off with his lab um, enriching uranium and discovering a new isotope of uranium uh, in 1940 with the 26 inch cyclotron. The army was very interested in this project even then, but once the 60 inch cyclotron was developed, um, they came in and asked specifically for help. This is a memo from Dr. Nishina to the, uh, one of the head generals of the army uh, detailing how the cyclotron would work to enrich uranium. So unfortunately um, for the lab, there were many issues with the project. Um, 
Dr. Nishino was unable to keep certain members of his lab because uh, both the draft and um, the Army and the Navy had competing projects, and so they were unable to uh, forward the project past the calculations. The Allied powers were also continuously bombing uh, Japan with uh, air raids throughout the time, and this significantly impacted Dr. Nishino with the bombing on Riken. Uh, during this uh, air raid, two-thirds of the buildings were destroyed, and Dr. Nishino's 26-inch cyclotron was also destroyed. However, the 60-inch cyclotron um, survived. However, uh, they would not be able to continue research much longer because um, in August 1945, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki occurs, and Japan surrenders days later. During this time, Dr. Nishino was one of the first scientists uh, at the site and was able to confirm that the U.S. had indeed dropped a nuclear weapon on Japan. So now we transition to after the war. Following the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, Dr. Nishino was in contact with uh, the American army and they came to Riken to examine their capabilities to develop their own nuclear program. They were aware of the nuclear, the U.S. was aware of the nuclear program to begin with in Japan, but they weren't sure how far they had progressed. However, while they were there, the Army discovered the 60-inch cyclotron and understood it only to be something that could be used to manufacture weapons. So they destroyed Dr. Nishino's 60-inch uh, cyclotron and threw it into the Tokyo Bay. Uh, this quote by Dr. Nishino I felt was especially powerful. This is 10 years of my life. It has nothing to do with bombs. And so he just had to watch helplessly as the army dismantled 10 years of his work. Um, the unfortunate thing was scientists in America weren't consulted about this beforehand. Uh, the army just went in without <coughs> asking and uh, did this. And many people think this was an especially tragic event for Japanese uh, science and Japanese physics. However, uh, Shortly after the war ends, Dr. Nishino became the president of Riken, and he was able to slowly um, develop Riken back into something that could reintegrate with the international science community. He turned it into a company so it wouldn't go bankrupt, um, and he reorganized it to focus again on industry and agriculture and medicine, which was something that science in Japan had been doing prior to um, the war and prior to the establishment of Riken. Um, this was in a letter to Bohr where he's laying the foundation of this work so that other people can um, take the lead on physics afterwards, but he has to put physics aside for the present. Dr. Nishina during this time was also vital for um, the development of the reintegration of Japan into the scientific community. Uh, he advocated against nuclear weapons. He, um, it, he brought in scientists uh, like I.I. I. Rabi, who was a nuclear uh, Nobel Prize winner at the time, uh, Dr. Kelly, who was uh, head of the US program to um, determine how to bring uh, Japan back into the international community. And so thanks to his connections prior to the war, Dr. Nishino was very vital in um, this project. Finally, Dr. Nishina uh, served as president for five years, but he passed away in 1951. He was planning to resume his physics research after um, before being hospitalized. Uh, however, he ended up developing liver cancer, potentially due to his work with radioactive materials. Uh, his legacy can be seen in his development of the Kleinishina formula and establishing strong research groups at Riken, which have persisted into today. Riken is still a um, very strong part of the research community. And he reintegrated Japan into the international physics uh, community. And 
I thought it was particularly interesting that there is a crater on the moon named after Nishina, so this is the Nishina crater. Okay, so following Dr. Nishina's passing, um, we can see how Dr. Asawa's career started to begin. Uh, he finished his math degree and he was able to return to California after uh, leaving the army. And he wanted to continue working on his farm, but his wife convinced him that he should return back into physics. And so he attended UCLA for, for his master's and then his PhD. Um, here is a picture of Dr. Asawa's research advisor at UCLA, Dr. Satin, who uh, specialized in solid state physics. And so uh, Dr. Asawa wanted to focus on the optical properties of uh, materials, which was especially important in the development of the first laser. So before I go into Dr. Asawa's contributions to the laser, I'll give you a little background. So for a laser, um, there is a, an external light source called a pump source, and it sends in photons. Those photons excite electrons in the lowest energy state, the ground state, into an upper energy level, which quickly decays into this metastable level. It doesn't release a photon in this case, but once it, the electron drops down from the metastable level to the lowest energy level, it can spontaneously emit a photon. Now, in a laser, the same system occurs. However, when a spontaneously emitted photon passes by an electron in this metastable level, it will release a stimulated, uh, stimulated emitted photon, which will have the same energy, same frequency, and same phase as the spontaneously emitted photon. Maybe a clearer picture might be this one. So here's the crystal. The pump light excites uh, atoms into this higher energy state, so their electrons in that are in that upper energy state. And when more of them are in the state than in the ground state, that's called a population inversion, and you can have a laser. So once some, pho uh, electro once some atoms start spontaneously emitting photons, <coughs> it can create stimulated emission, which is reflected between these two ends and keeps creating more and more photons because with a stimulated emission, you don't lose a photon, you just create a photon. And so those build up, and eventually you produce this coherent beam of light that we know as a laser beam. So the first laser is an amazing story in and of itself, and I won't be able to give it quite the depth that I would like to. Uh, but basically, there are multiple labs competing to create this laser. And the one that ended up winning was the one that Dr. Asawa worked in with Dr. Theodore Maimon. Their uh, design was one of the simplest ones. It involved a flash lamp from a camera, a piece of ruby, and then a reflective chamber. And the ends of the ruby were coated in a reflective silver paint. Uh, the laser, the first laser couldn't maintain a uh, beam of light consistently. Uh, it relied on a flash from the flash lamp and uh, at the time, the flash lamp was the strongest um, commercially available source to pr produce the population inversion. So that's what they went with. So Dr. Asawa's contribution to this project, he first examined a different material, gadolinoleum, as an alternative option to the ruby crystal. But he was able to tell Dr. Maimon that this wouldn't suffice. It's too hard to work with. Next, Dr. Maimon tasked him with finding a light source. Uh, Dr. Maimon wanted to work with a continuous pump source, but Dr. Asawa was able to recommend a flash lamp as a stronger source, if albeit a shorter lived beam uh, for the output. And when finally they were able to publish their results and create the first uh, beam of light from the laser, uh, Dr. Asawa made measurements of the intensity of emission at different wavelengths to determine that they had indeed produced um, stimulated light rather than spontaneously emitted light. And here's a plot uh, recreated from their first paper. Um, 
At when uh, Ruby is just spontaneously emitting light, these two wavelengths are about the same intensity, this one's double. But when stimulated light is emitted from a Ruby, the second wavelength becomes much stronger. And so Dr. Asawa performed those experiments following the production of the first laser. Their first uh, paper was actually a letter to nature uh, because they wanted to get it out as quickly as possible. It was called Stimulated Optical Radiation Ruby. It wasn't really recognized at the time um, what exactly it was until the press conference later. But at the end of the paper, Dr. Maiman was able to um, say that he was indebted to Dr. Asawa for his technical assistance in obtaining the measurements, which I thought was especially interesting. So following his work with the laser, um, Dr. Asawa finished his PhD in 1961, and he continued to work at HRL until moving to a second uh, company in 1983. Uh, Dr. Maiman had actually become the vice president there at the time, and so he was following in his footsteps. Um, between the two labs, uh, Dr. Osawa obtained 15 patents, and uh, you can look him up online, and he, you can find those patents are held by his family still. And he served as an optical engineering consultant uh, even after retirement uh, up until his death in 2004. So Dr. Osawa lived a fairly reserved life following the creation of the laser and he chose to focus on research important to him rather than the high impact research driven path that Dr. Nishina chose. By doing this lecture, I had hoped to accomplish many things. However, I feel the most important thing has been learning the non-textbook story of two fascinating men. Throughout my research, I also discovered similarities between my own life and theirs, ranging from doubts to continue in the field to finding a lucky break through my connections. Thank you all again for coming today and allowing me to share the stories of Dr. Nishina and Dr. Asawa. I hope today has been as wonderful for you as this past year of research has been for me. Thank you. Yeah, so um, his older brother at the time had tried to do that. Uh, his older brother was an inventor and he had tried to create a fire resistant paint and it failed miserably. And so Dr. Nishida saw this and uh, one of his other brothers had gone to engineering and said, if you choose to become a scientist versus an engineer, you won't make as much money. And um, in Japan at the time, engineers were hired outside of academia and put to uh, working in factories and whatnot, which would be an easier way for him to make money than to continue in um, the academic field. And he didn't really want to make his own company because of the failures of his family before him. So. <laughs> yeah. Did did they have families? Uh, yes, actually. So Dr. Nishina got married uh, upon returning from Europe, and he had two sons. And uh, Dr. Asawa had a daughter and a son. Yeah. Yep. Uh, great talk. Thanks. Thank you. I thought the part where you went to Arkansas was especially uh, fascinating. Thanks. What America history. And hasn't gotten with that site. It's yeah. Uh, no problem. Yeah. But um, I, I was interested in how uh, Dr. Nishina went to Europe mm -hmm. and worked with the people that were in the process of inventing modern physics, but somehow Japan hadn't gotten the memo that that was going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then he, so his research had uh, cloud chambers and all this yeah. practical stuff he had built himself. Mm -hmm. Did he learn that, like, Crash event in Europe, or was he collaborating with? Actually, yes. So while he was working in Cavendish Lab with Rutherford, uh, Geiger was there working on Geiger counters. Um, Wilson cloud chambers had been invented and were being improved constantly at the Cavendish Lab. And that was one of the first projects he did, was just tinkering around on these. And so he was able to bring back the technology 
Um, and then when he developed his own lab, he was able to purchase the technology from abroad because he was aware it existed. Yeah. So, so here's from Japan that he went to a host of countries around, yep. not all of which speak the same language. Yeah. What language other than Japanese did he speak and how did that? So when he uh, moved to England, he had three months to learn English, so he tried to, to learn it. Um, he also learned German and French while abroad. And he, if you look at his notes, he'll al often alternate between Japanese, German, English. <laughs> and I was just like, ah, oh, that's pretty similar to how I write my notes sloppy, too. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. How unique was uh, uh, Dr. Osama's experience with internment uh, among physicists? Among Do you physicists? know of any other who <coughs> was a reasonably well known mm -hmm. physicist and that's I couldn't find any evidence of well known physicists that were interned at at least the same camp. Um, I'm pretty I, I didn't explore so much the other camps. I know that a lot of uh, people in Washington and California and camps were better known. Uh, but it's definitely something I want to expand for the research. Um, when I visited Rower, the curator there gave me a list of people I could contact uh, who were for more former internees. And so um, I definitely want to continue this project and get to interview other people. So that's definitely something I'll look into. Yeah. So I'm looking back at your future life. What did you learn? Um, I definitely learned to keep sticking with it in the face of difficulties. Um, I, I personally have felt, faced a lot of difficulty in continuing in my physics career. I often contemplate going back to art or psychology and um, learning more about them and the doubts they had even. Um, Dr. Nishina almost became a scientific toy maker after his failures in the first lab. And so I, I definitely was inspired by um, how they pushed through the roadblocks life threw at them. So, anyone else? Yeah. Well, thank you, Ali, for a little bit. Yes, I definitely recommend it. It was a really good experience. <laughs>